Uh, actually, I don't know if I really clicked on it or just lost focus. Okay, I think it's probably fine. Yeah, I think it's fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, we start the seminar of this week. This occasion we have uh, Volodymyr Babchenko, uh, uh, assistant professor from the University of Houston. He got his PhD on Gordon University in Frankfurt and then made a research uh, assistant there as well. Mm -hmm. A research associate. Yes. Correct. And then uh, he made a postdoc in Berkeley and then a professor, research professor in INT. After getting, after getting to the University of Washington, he will talk about baryonic or quartionic. That's the big question. And mm -hmm. thank you for coming mm -hmm. today. Thank you, absolutely. So it's a big pleasure uh, to be here and to give this talk right after the semester has ended so I can get back to research a little bit and talk a little bit about my work. So I was thinking about the topics and I would normally talk about heavy ion collisions and fluctuations in heavy ion collisions, but I think that um, this topic is equally interesting and maybe more interesting here in at ISU where quarkionic matter is also in the focus of research in the nuclear theory group of uh, several members of the group. So I will talk about the recent uh, work in that direction where we explored quarkionic matter and confronted it with, uh, in a way, opposite scenario, which we called, which we introduced and called baric work matter, and what this means on the mechanism for dynamical generation of this uh, structure, this momentum spatial structure in cold and dense QCD. So this is based on the work uh, recently that we put on archive in the fall, and it was published in Physics Letters B today. So today I received notification that the article is available online. So uh, uh, there are some details there and we are also making further progress. I was an incoming postdoc in Houston, Roman Pulberezhnyuk uh, in that direction. So this talk uh, consists of two parts. Um, in the first part, I will give a sort of general introduction to the problem and what I think are interesting key questions for QCD at finite temperature and density, and then we will zero in on the uh, cold and dense QCD and the topic of quarkionic matter. So uh, the basic uh, introduction to set the stage, we are dealing uh, with uh, matter under extreme condition, this nuclear matter, so we are looking into, so the best way to see this um, in the beginning, is we know what are protons, neutrons, but we know that uh, if we put them under extreme condition, in particular heat them up, that these particles become uh, dissolved. They are not uh, fundamental particles, but they are composite particles. And under our current understanding is that their constituents are quarks and gluon, rather, which we do not observe exactly. And so uh, they... So we are interested in these basic uh, features of the nuclear force. And in particular, if you look at, uh, at where we can find, or we could find if we look in the past, in the history of the universe, such a matter that would be microseconds after the Big Bang. And this matter we believe existed at that time and we want to learn more about. It. So we, think that we know the correct theory for describing the strong interactions that is quantum chromodynamics so it's a it's a quantum field theory um, and it describes strong nuclear force in terms of quarks and gluons so we know what the theory is we know the precise definition of this theory and we know some of the uh, basic features of the theory quarks and gluons carry color charge, but they are not observed directly. We never observed any free quark and gluon because at small energies, um, we observe composite objects, baryons and mesons, which uh, in QCD are understood as object consisting of either three quarks or a quark anti quark pair, and which are color neutral. So the scales, I'm sure you're familiar there, but just in, in case, 
Uh, that's femtometers 10 to the minus 15 meters. Temperatures are uh, trillions of Kelvin. So we are dealing with uh, matter, which is by far the hottest one created in the lab. Where is it relevant? Uh, early universe, as mentioned before, but also QCD matter under extreme conditions can be recreated in laboratory in heavy ion collisions, right? We, by colliding uh, nuclei head on, accelerated to ultra relativistic energies and velocities as well as in astrophysics, in particular interior of neutron stars consist of uh, dense QCD matter and neutron star. Uh, and this uh, properties of this matter be behavior uh, determine some of the basic features of neutron stars, like their mass and radius relationship, as well as properties of neutron star mergers, as we will discuss in a bit. Um, so when we talk about QCD matter under extreme conditions, one, uh, useful concept one can introduce is the phase diagram of QCDO. So what this means is that essentially there are two basic ways to put matter under extreme conditions. One way is to heat this up. So you regulate temperature. And another method is to compress it to very high densities. And so you can explore two axes, corresponding axes um, on the phase diagram, temperature and density. And from purely theoretical perspective, we know exactly uh, what we do. So we would calculate a statistical operator of the theory of QCD. So this is uh, how, in principle, you can define QCD uh, phase diagram. But in practice, we actually don't know all that much about it because interesting stuff happens in the regime where theory is non-perturbative. So um, what we do know is that at low densities, we don't observe quarks, but we observe hadrons. So when you are at low temperature or density where the matter is dilute, you would expect something resembling a gas of hadrons. On the other hand, we have asymptotic freedom and running of the coupling constant. And uh, we expect weak interactions in the regime of high temperatures and densities where hadrons would melt and eventually uh, matter, which we call quark gluon plasma, would emerge. But what is the nature of this transition uh, between these two regimes? And actually, maybe there is not just one transition, but many more stuff happening in between. We don't know because it's inherently non-perturbative question. And you can even see that just from the mere fact that hadrons are not basic degrees of freedom. You write the Lagrangian, you don't see any hadrons anywhere. And if you do perturbative QCD, of course, you will not get hadrons either. So this question, non-perturbative, one tool, essentially the only truly first principle tool that we have in practice is lattice QCD, which by now has measured enough to obtain several very uh, nice and useful results. Uh, one result I particularly like because it's a, uh, I think it's a really strong test of the theory as being correct theory of nuclear force is the prediction of hadron masses. So the, uh, of course, there are a couple of parameters even in fundamental theory like masses of quarks and the renormalization scale, but the number of empirical hadron masses is much larger. So you can fix these parameters, for example, to pi on k on masses and for the strange parks xi and predict uh, the rest of the masses and compare it to experiment and see a very remarkable agreement. So this was done. Uh, this plot is from around 15 years ago by BMW collaboration, showing remarkable agreement of theory with the experiment as probably expected, but nevertheless, very important milestone. Coming back to the question of phases of QCD, uh, Lattice QCD has also provided us certain uh, answers and perspective on the nature of transition in the regime of vanishing baryon density right here. And what, uh, because uh, at zero baryon density, if you look a little bit in the details of how lattice QCD is done, it doesn't suffer from the sign problem. If you write it in terms of a functional integral, you can treat uh, the, the integrant as a probability this distribution after you discretized uh, your lattice and uh, sampling configurations from this probability distribution, calculate observables, various observables, in, including thermodynamic observables. 
which are shown here. And this is the equation of state of QCD from first principles on lattice using lattice QCD as function of temperature and zero baryon density. What it shows us is that the transition is is a crossover uh, with, from low temperatures and hadronic matter to quark-gluon matter at high temperatures. So there is no abrupt changes of um, system properties and system parameters. From purely mathematical perspective, what this tells us is there is a smooth connection between hadrons and quarks. And the characteristic temperature is called pseudocritical temperature. That's why there is index of PC rather than critical one, because it's a crossover and it's of order of 155 MeV. So if you have a smooth connection and essentially coexistence of hadrons and quarks, you can talk about quark-hadron duality, that there is a dual description. You can approach the crossover from hadronic side, you can approach it from a partonic side. And if done properly, they should smoothly merge. So on the hadronic side, typically uh, this duality is realized or can be understood by uh, adding uh, resonance states. So hadronic excitations. And in the most extreme case, you can consider uh, Huggett, exponential Huggett spectrum. And coupled, this is two plus one. Yeah. U and D quarks degenerate and there is an S quark as well. Uh, and uh, uh, the lines here is a type of model uh, which considers adding resonances. So here it's called hadron resonance gas model. And in, the, in uh, most common implementations, one includes all uh, states listed in particle data uh, tab, uh, book, which are considered to be established. And another ingredient is the eigenvolumes of hadrons, so that the hadrons have finite size. They cannot um, overlap, or when they start to overlap, then there is they don't behave like point particles anymore. There is some interaction. So that's another ingredient. On the quark side, uh, there is perturbative QCD, but it doesn't quite go down to these temperatures because uh, what we have here is understood as strongly coupled quark gluon plasma rather than wicked coupled. There, therefore, um, extended versions of perturbation theory like the one called hard thermal loop are considered and the smooth matching between the two in this case can be achieved. So this is, for instance, was done in this paper by Albright, Kapusta, and Yama. So this is about the transition and states of matter in at zero chemical potential. Sure. Yes? Uh, what do you mean by crossover? What does it mean? Uh, crossover means that there is no singularities in the partition function or in thermodynamic function. So th there is no jump, for example, in energy density as you increase temperature. And there is no jump in the derivative or any derivative of energy density. So it's completely smooth. It's an analytic function. And uh, what does that mean? It indicates that uh, there is a smooth uh, transition and there is connection. So in principle, uh, the, it would, for instance, indicate that if you knew, if you start here at 130 MeV and you would know all temperature derivatives to arbitrary order, you could construct, for example, Taylor expansions successively and you could reach the high temperatures. You would need infinite precision essentially in all these derivatives, but the principal statement that there is analytic, it's an analytic function and there is a connection. Uh, and uh, physically, this indicates that there is a, so there is a quark-hadron coexistence essentially everywhere. I mean, it could be exponentially suppressed such that there is no chance to see it in practice, but because it's a analytic, I mean, theory is QCD, right? So there is in nature, there could be some corrections, who knows? But uh, this indicates uh, that there is a smooth connection. Or uh, example of crossover um, from more common fluids that we study, like a uh, phase diagram of water, right? Below critical temperature, you have gas-liquid transition, first order phase transition. Above, you don't have it. So you, you, you don't have distinction between gas and liquid anymore. So, so. I see. In, in that sense, it's similar. It's also different because still we have transition between effective degrees of freedom in contrast to water. 
Huh? Ah, the uh, in uh, the phase transition. Mm -hmm. uh, what exactly the? Uh, no, uh, yeah, okay. It, it's it's a pseudo transition. It's a pseudo phase transition, right? It's not a true phase transition. You can talk about ch phase change that you have. If you go to low temperatures, you have something resembling one phase, and you go to high temperatures, you have something resembling completely different phase. But the path from low T to high T is smooth, right? So there is no abrupt change like you would for a true phase transition. This is, so this is what we call analytic crossover, typically. And that, this is at zero chemical potential. Then if we go to finite mu B, um, we, uh, so if we think about it in terms of first principle theory, we encounter an uh, issue called sign problem. Uh, namely that the uh, that the the fermion determinant becomes complex and the integrand here which i will not go into details becomes a complex value so it loses the meaning of a probability distribution and you can consider some ways to go around this issue like moving complex part into absorbable from probability distribution but then um, the problem in, then in encounters elsewhere like very high oscillations of uh of the probability distribution or you are sampling if you use important sampling technique for example you will sample tail of the distribution and with no reasonable statistics at finite mu you will ever get enough so sign problems prevents simulation direct simulations at finite baryon density so what uh, currently has been achieved is that extrapolations from mu b equals zero are done for instance, um, you could calculate derivatives, right? I talked about derivatives with respect to temperature. You could calculate derivatives with respect to chemical potential as well at zero chemical potential, and then try to use these derivatives using Taylor series and uh, expectations that you have analytic uh, partition function to peak into finite mu b. You can do that, and this works roughly until mu b over t of uh, two or three, that's where we see apparent convergence of the Taylor series in chemical potential. And this shows that in this regime, there is no evidence for critical point because with critical point, you would see certain peculiarities in Taylor expansion, um, which we don't see, uh, but above uh, we don't really, see, uh, so the number of terms calculated from lattice in practice is about three and maybe with larger error, four terms. And that's, you can only go so far with that. But this is also the statement there is no evidence for critical point in this regime. Yeah, usually we introduce the dimensionless ratio of mu B over temperature with heavy ion data and proton number fluctuations. So critical point would indicate large fluctuations. Think about critical opalescence, for example, for a, for a liquid gas uh, and that would be expected to show up in fluctuations in heavy ion collisions, but we don't see these signals either. So this is about finite T, finite mu B. But ultimately, um, if you go to finite density in terms of mu B over T ratio, the ultimate limit is zero temperature where the ratio is infinite. And this is this regime where there are no thermal excitations, no resonances, no pions but where there is uh, effects of uh, Pauli blocking of Fermi spheres are um, all important. So it's a very different regime, even if you just take a quick glance on it compared to uh, fine, uh, T direction. So we were talking about this, now we are talking about the, this axis. And this regime, though it's not accessible in uh, first principle theory, it is, accessible, especially lately in astrophysics and in neutron star properties. And just one remark about uh, first principles. Okay, there is still perturbative QCD, uh, but in practice, this only works at densities above 40 times the saturation density. And below that, it does not provide too much insight at the moment. So QCD transition at zero temperature and neutron stars. So what is the uh, connection? Um, so the several connections, but one uh, 
perhaps the most well known is that uh, you can find QCD matter at zero temperature in the interior of neutron stars. And the pressure of this matter, okay, along with, of course, leptons, but in particular, the pressure of QCD balances the gravitational pull of neutron star, right? And you can, uh, there is Tolman Oppenheimer Wolkoff equation, which describes the uh, this equilibrium, a differential equation where the pressure of QCD plus leptons is an input. Okay, leptons are simple, you usually just add ideal gas, uh, but the pressure of QCD is something we want to know, something we don't know, right? Because it's a number perturbative problem. And so it serves as an input. And so what this equation provides us, if you solve it and integrate it from zero to the radius of the star, it provides you what is known a mass radius curve for neutron stars. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence through these equations between the pressure of QCD as function in this case of energy density, which enters uh, tolman oppenheimer wolkov equation, and the resulting mass radius curve. So if you have, like there are several, for example, lines here, pressure versus energy density, and each line has a one-to-one -one correspondence to resulting mass radius curve. And so if you know, for instance, if you have observations of both mass and radius of neutron star with certain accuracy, you can see which equation of state is consistent with that data and which is not, right? That is in addition to other constraints called multi-messenger constraint nowadays on the equation of state at zero temperature coming also not only from observation of masses and radii of neutron star, but also of observables from neutron star mergers like tidal deformabilities of neutron stars, what we know from nuclear physics at low densities, as well as from heavy ion collisions at uh, intermediate energies, and at very high densities from perturbative QCD as well. So at the moment, uh, we have recently quite a lot of input from especially astrophysics that it allowed analysis, essentially model agnostic analysis of QCD equation of state under neutron star conditions. So that means zero uh, net charge, which is why it's mostly composed of neutrons and not protons. So in, in this regime, essentially uh, what nowadays become possible is to have model agnostic analysis. So you, for example, you like, uh, in, in this work was done, you use neural network to inverse the mapping from mass radius relation or observations of masses and radii to the equation of state. So for example, pressure is function of energy density. That's the basic observable, but actually any thermodynamic observable is function of energy density. If you know it completely, defines the equation of state at zero temperature. And one particularly useful uh, quantity which is often used as a uh, base input, is the speed of sound. And it's, it's definition um, at zero temperature. Well, it's change of energy with respect to change of pressure, but at zero uh, temperature, you can define it as change of chemical potential with respect to baryon density. And then if you integrate this, uh, you can get uh, chemical potential as function of baryon density, and then if you integrate this again, you obtain energy density, right? So if you know the functional dependence, you can recover from thermodynamic relations, equation of state for any quantity you're interested in. But speed of sound useful also because, um, I mean, we know there are certain restrictions, right? Speed of sound should be causal, should not exceed the speed of light. So by looking, for instance, at the pressure, it may not be evident whether there is issues, but if you look at speed of sound, if it's about one, you know it, you, there is a problem. There is also conformal limit. Um, so it's the limit where um, it's the expected limit at high densities, but also in this limit, um, energy density is equal three times the pressure, but there is no energy scale anymore. And that's one third, speed of sound is one third. So what is observed uh, is that speed of sound just 
purely based on observations without. Uh, so the model input, I, I think the only model input is very low densities, nuclear physics properties, which are solid. So it's uh, nuclear normal nuclear density and below. Above it, it's completely free. It's constrained with observations, indications that is very high probability. The speed of sound exceeds the conformal limit, exhibits a peak. Uh, typically, it's a few times the normal nuclear density. And then it, then it dips. And from perturbative QCD, we know that it should approach from below the conformal limit. So there is an interesting non-monotonic behavior purely based on observational data. This is the speed of sound. Um, this is the same, essentially. So these bands correspond to the, this confidence levels here shown by different colors. For the speed of sound, pressure is function of energy density. And you see how, uh, in a way, much more instructive the speed of sound is, because here, admittedly, it's a double log scale. Otherwise, it doesn't fit, right? But uh, you see a band, you see perturbative QCD regime, you see normal nuclear physics regime, and you see a band for the equation of state. Okay, so we have the equation of state, but um, so what do we do with it now? Right. So it's a neutron star matter regime. It's consistent with nuclear physics at low density, consider it's perturbative PCD at high density. It does not elucidate what is actually the uh, phase of matters or properties of matter in this regime. It just tells you that pressure changes with energy density in this way, but what is it? Or how many hadrons we have here and how many quarks we have here? What is the fraction or is it even the valid question? It doesn't answer this question. So for understanding this, one has to come back to the theory and some expected properties and possible. Is the border made? I have seen that not so many times. This one? Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, they use these different parameters in the in the estimation by Bayesian analysis. And this uh, correspond to various confidence levels. That they extract. I will have. I would need to look myself into the details, <laughs> right? Because it, it, there is lots of technical de uh, technicalities. No, yeah. So the from the model, there is only um, nuclear ground state properties essentially here, and per, and matching to perturbative QCD above forty times saturation. So so there is so this matching is enforced. But in between, you can think of this, for example, as if you go back to speed of sound, um, you can think of this that they that they they do piecewise continuous segments of speed of sound at various. So here there's data going in, in the input here. Uh, they on, yes. the, on the right hand side plot. Uh, no, right hand side plot is, yeah. is 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 when you integrate the speed of sound. Right, but is the information coming from the data? Yes. Yeah, yes. So, so essentially, you you parameter not not parameterize, but you have speed of sound in various density intervals, which can have arbitrary values, like for example linear interpolation. So you have slope, and the magnitude uh, and the intercept, and they are smoothly connected, and these are all three parameters, right? Which you feed into Bayesian analysis. But for any fixed value of these parameters, you can integrate speed of sound to get the pressure. And then you can put the pressure into tau equation, for example, get mass radius curve. And then you apply this to mass radius observations, for example. And tidal deformabilities, similarly, and so on. Yeah, so this, you minimize deviations from observations and you give them the most, uh, well, actually it gives you distributions, right? The likelihood that uh, the most likely equation of state consistent with the observation, right? And I think if you read the paper, what they say is that there is, in principle, it's possible there is equation of state which never exceeds the speed, uh, the conformal limit, uh, but it, I think it's less than 1%. 
in a probabilistic sense. Okay, so since we have the equation of state, but um, we don't quite know what exactly the matter is, which is consistent with this equation of state. So we can go back to uh, various ideas, theories, and expected properties and degrees of freedom. So at zero temperature, uh, so the basic approach would be that, again, we have here variants at zero temperature. So it's a Fermi liquid of variants of, or of nucleons. And you have a quark phase at very high densities. So in between, you would expect some sort of transition and coexistence between variants and quarks. Arguments based on properties of expected properties of QCD and large NC limit. So yeah, NC in nature is three, but large NC is hopefully also three, right? Is that you still have baryonic excitations even at high densities occurring around the Fermi surface. So this is the idea. But how to test it? So I believe the first practical realization was done in Seattle by uh, Larry and Sanjay, where they considered a quasi-particle picture of a mixture of quarks in two regimes. Uh, one is confined quarks, so quarks which form baryons. So what this means is that uh, it's a simplest model, there is no internal motion, that there is each three quarks form a baryon, and each quark carries one third of momentum of the baryon. So it's uh, the simplest thing you can assume, and they assume the, the chiral symmetry is broken, so the masses of quarks are constituent quark mass. And the second component is uh, our deconfined quarks, so the quarks which don't uh, which are not tied to the nuclear momentum anymore. But both of these should obey the uh, Pauli exclusion principle at zero temperature, because if you have a quark, for instance, a deconfined quark in the C as in the quartillonic matter picture, you're not supposed to put another quark in exactly the same state. So the way they realized uh, this was through introducing the momentum shell structure that in this mixture you have quarks filling up the Fermi surface, uh, Fermi C, sorry, uh, up to a certain level. How high the level is depends on what is the baryon density you're looking at. And then it's surrounded by a shell of baryons. Right, okay, there is a factor of NC in the momentum, which one should always be mindful about. So, so actually, here this uh, is done. So, so here, essentially, one has to divide momentum of quarks by nc. Uh, and then you would get slightly different picture. But uh, the essence is, is the same. So if you have quarks filling up the levels up to kfq, then the quarks on the shell of baryons, it's one third of a baryon quark. So it can only start from kfq. So the momentum of a baryon starts from three times kfq. Uh, in this notation. Or NC times, yeah, for general uh, case. And in the first paper, they introduced the, the, the width of the shell uh, via certain ansatz, right? So it, it was, it did not occur dynamically from the model. We will get to this point in a bit. But it was assumed that the shell so initially, right, the shell should be the entire Fermi C because you have only baryons at low densities. But eventually, it becomes smaller than this maximum momentum of baryons, and it becomes thinner. So you fill the Fermi C with increasingly large amount of quarks at large densities, and you will ex expect uh, the bulk properties to resemble quark matter. So this is the mechanism. And with a judicious choice of the answers, you can obtain 
uh, you can look you can see how the speed of sound will behave in the transition region which is where is the interesting part right where you can have where you have comparable fractions of deconfined and confined quarks or baryons if you like and typically you will see a peak in the speed of sound how high it is exactly and at which density it is exactly depends on the choice of the ansatz. It could very well also shoot up over unity if you're not careful with this choice. But qualitatively, this is the picture that you have uh, this race of the speed of sound. And then once quarks start to appear, they will tame this phase and bring the speed of sound down. But what's uh, this uh, justification for this picture? I this works uh, forming the process of the mm -hmm. and so on. Why not vice versa? Yeah, the vice versa, versa is what we will do. But the original justification is that um, basically, um, so the confining interactions are poly blocked, if you put quarks in the C and not vice versa the infrared regime but that's the justification originally to enforce this picture but it probably is also true that once you're in this transition regime all bets are off right and which is also the motivation of uh essentially my study to which i'm almost getting to but if you stay for a moment with this picture, of course, there is this issue that not only we enforce the this uh, structure by hand that you have baryons on the shell, but also the the behavior of the Fermi shell width is also put in essentially by hand, and so one would want to improve that to somehow make it appear dynamical. So this was done in a in a paper shortly after this initial paper. And three is also on it. What you can do is you want to how, how could the shell appear dynamically? You want it to be the outcome of energy minimization, right? So if you, if you are in canonical ensemble, the equilibrium should be for the minimum of the three energies or the total energy at zero temperature, they are the same. And so you want to this parameter to be able to be varied and ultimately correspond to the minimum of the free energy at fixed parent density. Um, so if you do that, the first thing you will notice, if you do mixture of free nucleons and free quarks, you will notice that no matter how high you put the baryon density, the minimum will always be for pure nucleon matter which was understood to be most likely an artifact of treating nucleons as free particles. And so the excluded volume, which proved to be quite useful at finite temperature regime, should also be relevant in the zero temperature regime. So, so what uh, excluded volume does, it's a, a type of repulsion where you don't allow nucleon cores to overlap. So, so one assumes that nucleons are not point particles, but of a finite size. And if you don't allow them to overlap, this leads to the appearance of this excluded volume correction factor in the density of nucleons, but also in their energy density as well. And if then you consider the equation of state of nucleons in excluded volume model at fixed density, as you crank up, the size of the excluded volume, the energy density will shoot up. Or equivalently, if you fix the size and increase the baryon density, at some point uh, you reach this packing limit, right? So you cannot put make density of nucleons too large anymore. And in this case, the uh, the density cannot increase anymore, but the chemical uh, potential still increases. If you look at 
for instance, thermodynamic relations, then energy density just shoots up. It makes it energetically unfavorable at some point to have nucleons because of excluded volume as you increase density. And when that happens, pure nucleon matter cannot exist beyond N0 and not, but even just before that, it becomes energetically unfavorable. So what becomes energetically favorable is to have some fraction of quarks contributing instead of just nucleons. So at certain density, the minimum of the energy density corresponds to non-zero quark fraction. And this is uh, this is illustrated here. So if, if you are below the quark answer density, you have only baryons and the shell is, is also the seed, right? So the, the whole uh, momentum space is filled by baryons. But as you increase baryon density, you have this factor. So this thing increases and this factor starts to contribute and the equilibrium changes. Yeah. It's not only the pure nuclear matter which is preferred, but the mixture. So the quarks start to appear and progressively at high densities, the shell of barons becomes thinner and thinner. So this qualitatively works, right? You obtain shell structure dynamically and also works reasonably well for neutron stars with certain modifications. As was explored in several papers here and elsewhere, but there are issues, right? So the issues are, yeah, it helps to explain how the quarks appear, that's good. It does not, still does not explain why we put Quarks in the sea and baryons on the surface. At least it doesn't it doesn't emerge dynamically, right? We have arguments why this should be the case, based on confining interactions of quarks, right? But it doesn't appear from the theory itself that if you let energy minimize, it would prefer this over the opposite scenario. And another one is that. But it does emerge in the. It, no, but it, it but you enforce baryons to be on the surface, right? So the delta, the width, the delta emerges dynamically, but not the structure itself, right? right. Yeah. So so that, that I'm referring yeah, to this. You are uh, assuming confinement, right? I mean, we are not solving QCD here. If we are solving QCD, then you are hoping that that will emerge. Well, or if you're solving something which resembles QCD more closely, right, than this, I would say. <laughs> well, uh, Larry and uh, Rob would argue that lar at large I assume they proved it. Well, I, they would argue this, but one could also argue that in this picture, this, as we will see, is unstable, this equilibrium. So they may have to do a little bit more in that regard. But another shortcoming and the headache of this picture is that if you just do it as we so far discussed and look at the speed of sound, yes, you will still get the raise and then drop, but the behavior will be very much singular of the speed of sound. The peak exceeds. Actually, I think for lambda equals zero, it, there is even, it like goes to infinity and then comes back from minus infinity, something like that. Uh, if you, so you, the equation of state itself is all causal. And the reason is that the quark on set appears a little bit too late. So excluded volume is inherently a causal theory. Once you push the density, at some point it will break down and the speed of sound will go up without anything stopping it. Mm -hmm. And so if the quark onset starts in that regime where speed of sound of pure nuclear matter is already off the chart, this issue appears. And it, is, it seems empirically, um, I think it's not proven theoretically that in this picture, it's always the case, even if you consider modifications to repulsion, excluded volume repulsion, that disappears. 
In Larry and Sanji's picture, it was the issue didn't appear, but that's because their shell structure was introduced as an ansatz, which made quark appearance a little bit earlier. So with infrared regulator, where essentially you modify the quark density of states uh, in the infrared regime, so at low momenta, you can address this and make speed of sound behave reasonably. But of course, it's a parameter and it's difficult to constrain the value of the parameter independently. You can constrain it in a way that it shouldn't be too small such that speed of sound behaves reasonably, but an independent confirmation is challenging. So the predictive power then is somewhat lost. But the question that we, yeah, okay, there is another artifact which I don't go into detail, but with, but once you introduce regulator, there is also uh, this strange phenomenon of quarks appearing at very low densities. So then you have to make some density dependent regulator to address also that. But the question we want to address here is whether quarkionic matter shell structure is the energetically preferred state of dense QCD matter and whether it will emerge in a through the negative mechanism. It's an ambiguous phrase, but as an example, if you put quarks and variants into a transport and let things equilibrate, will quarks be in the sea or will they be on the surface? Just as an example. So something where you can have some freedom for the momentum uh, arrangement between quarks and variants. So to start to tackle this issue, we decided to consider uh, this Walker Cox at Berkeley Lab. An opposite scenario for the realization of the Pauli exclusion principle in a generic system of a mixture of baryons and quarks. But instead of enforcing baryons to be on the shell and quarks in the sea, we did the opposite. We enforced still, right? So it's still not a general case, but we enforced the opposite scenario. So quarks will be on the surface, baryons, baryons will be on the sea, in the sea. Okay, so these are the equations. Um, I probably I don't really need to go through them, but the difference you have density of quarks as well as their energy density. Now, uh, so in quark ionic, it's the C, so it starts from zero to a certain Fermi momentum. And then baryons are on the shell, but also their momentum is enhanced by factor NC to account for the fact that the momentum of a baryon is NC times momentum of a quark inside the baryon. So you have this shell. And you have for nucleons the same interactions depending only on the density. So you have a fluid volume factor. Where do you put quarks and uh, baryons in the scale shell? I mean, the same shell structure. Uh, what, what do you mean on the same shell structure? Why, yeah, why they find the same shell structure, not two parameters? Uh, um, you mean that they could overlap? or? Yes. Yeah, they could, but this is the extreme opposite. So we, we consider limiting cases. Yeah. So you could have like yeah, you could have like 50% by quarks, 50% by baryons uniformly. You could okay, in the very extreme case, you could even neglect Pauli principle and just have them both occupy two C's. And even that works reasonably well. <laughs> in I mean the equation of state looks reasonably well, not that it makes perfect sense. sense. Yeah, but these are two limiting cases. This Pauli exclusion principle. This is isospin symmetric. They only talk through the Pauli exclusion principle. Yeah, baryons talk only with other baryons with excluded volume, but not with quarks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, let's see. I can see. <laughs> So this is uh, equations for Berry quark. So you have C of nucleons now, Fermi C, and surrounded by the shell of quarks. So everything is the same, just the limits of integrations are exchanged. Uh, I have a like, really question. Mm -hmm. yeah. question. So like, is there any way to understand that the appearance of shell structure okay, there is a solution of E to the So you could solve it that E to the C. This is what Robert is why we do, right? Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, but uh, if you can see, so it's like the plus thing too, right? So, but you could the principle like uh, develop one or this direction, taking that now some of the block directions. Right? If you have any way to see emergence of this thermal surfaces, like when you step away from the thing, you can see like the signal. Like, well, I, I mean, I don't think they, they I, I don't think they ever actually did anything like this. Like they only did excitations on the surface. There was no quasi particles or anything. So yeah. But they see it's infinite. Uh, this is again this plus away so variance and polytons in that so this is a plus right. But what I mean that mm -hmm. uh thermal surfaces feel quantum dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to take into account like quantum fluctuations. Mm -hmm. So what I suggest, so you say C equals C is large. I can't read that. No, well, I, I no, that's not what I say. That I I explain the motivation for quarkionic matter. You can find in the literature. <laughs> so okay, so but, but uh, you have this infinite C solution, and you could in principle develop mm -hmm. uh, one over compute one over A C, assuming that C can find it, and like low interpolation theory. Mm -hmm. So has anyone? I think it's very hard. Yeah, I, I don't. I assume it's kind of tested. Yeah, it's not it's it's attempted to. I don't think. So one thing it. that people so. have done for quarkionic mm -hmm. is that there's Stone Cook who has put this quarkionic idea in one plus one sugar bar. Okay. Put in a chemical potential and you see what kind of shell structure. If if you see any shell structure, okay. you can solve it exactly. Right. And yeah. I believe we, we see of this kind of emergence basically. We have there, it's not a Fermi sphere, it's a one line. Mm -hmm. And near the Fermi surface, you see some kind of bounce uh, uh, And uh, in, the, in the deep within the sea, mm -hmm. you see some. Yeah, I mean, I think they are working on something with Larry in that direction. I don't think it's one over NC. It's just free theory with quarks and baryons on a little bit more equal footing than here. Uh, I think in the paper Toru published, he did make it observation. But if I remember correctly, there at some point there was an ansatz, and he checked if this ansatz so works ansatz consistently. I think that I'm in one plus one, okay. which is exactly solved. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't, I, I didn't see then this paper, I think. Um, I haven't digested the paper to know it's whether it's correct or not, okay. but I know that that's the motivation because it's exactly solvable, so mm -hmm. you can see that which one emerges. Mm. Okay, that that would be interesting. I mean, I don't know if there is uh, in the original quarkionic paper something about one D, two D, only three D, right? Yeah. Okay. And also, just because it emerges in one plus one doesn't mean that it will emerge. Right. That is. But a, it's a, well, that, that's interesting. Yes. That's of course the big question. How? Yeah, I can see equal three. Right. Um, okay. But let's. So I mean, this is still very simple. It's just quasi particles. So, let, but let's see what happens. So, in these two scenarios. Um, so at each baryon density, we minimize the energy density with respect to quark fraction. Uh, I mean, it's equivalent to Kf and delta, right? You, you, you fix baryon density and quark fraction. It's the same as fixing um, the shell widths and the permissive. So, it, so because baryon density is an external quantity, right? So it's only one parameter we have to minimize, which is quark fraction. And this is illustrative example. So we take, um, so for exceeded volume, two scenarios, no repulsion, not, no, nothing at all. And scenario where the limiting density is five times the normal one. And you see that if there is no repulsion, so it's three nucleons and three quarks, in all cases, the minimum is, is a pure nucleon matter, right? That is something I mentioned already before, but also is true for buried quarks. But already in this regime, you can see that if you look even at the slope, if you increase quark fraction a little bit, the, uh, the Berry quark scenario, the energy increases in both cases, but with very different slopes. Eventually, they merge together by construction because pure quark matter is the same in both cases. So the difference are only in between. So, already in this scenario, you can see that. 
in this this picture it's energetically more favorable to put uh, quarks on the surface than on the sea and this one can understand because if you for example if you are in this regime and you on the nucleons and then if you add in body quarks you what you do is just replace variants at the surface by quarks right because quarks are on the shell but in quarkionic, you replace variants deep in the sea by quarks, and you have to also move other variants up because of NC factor in the moment. So for this reason, there is much steeper penalty in the energy. With excluded volume, um, so this density is high enough. It's close to, uh, it's where excluded volume interruptions are already very strong. Uh, the minimum falls in both cases at finite quark fraction, but the deeper minimum is with paired quark. So qualitatively, uh, absolute volume doesn't change the behavior with respect to quark fraction uh, between these two scenarios, but it is, of course, needed to have a true minimum. Okay, this is how the shell structure looks like um, as function of density. So, so these are momentum levels and and which momentum level is filled with load. So this is quarkionic. So you have you have shell of baryons without quarks, and then on the onset of quarks, quarks appear in the sea, the shell gets thinner. Barry quark, again, before the blue line, which is on set of quarks, it's exactly the same in both scenarios because it's pure baryons. Um, but then quarks appear on the surface, and the picture becomes deep. And you may see that here that there are more quark variants, but actually the density of states scales with k squared, right? In 3D, in three dimensions. So actually, this width you have to probably multiply by k squared to get the actual number of quarks and actual den density of quarks and variants in a given moment. The appearance of quarks and very quarks also comes earlier. This is natural because you manage to minimize energy with respect to pure nuclear matter. Right. So it appears that way. Okay, the equation of state. Um, in two cases, so what's shown here, energy dense energy per uh, per baryon, and we subtract nuclear mass just to make uh, the plot the differences more visible between different cases. So the solid lines, but blue one, quark U and red one, very quark. They are identical here before quark starts to appear. Um, <clears throat> But then quarks appear more smoothly in body quark, so the line doesn't change too much. And in quarkionic matter, they appear more rapidly, right? This is the manifestation of this. Uh, it's in the absence of regulator, right? So this is manifestation of this sudden stiffening of the equation of state. This regulator, you can smooth it a little bit, but even, the, even then, uh, the energy uh, is still higher than for body quark without regulator. And Okay, this I uh, okay attraction. This uh, is uh, a detail so that if you add load uh, load attraction between nucleons, like which you know from low energy nuclear physics, some mean field attraction, then you can delay the appearance of quarks in very quark matter. And it, probably it makes the model a little bit more realistic, but that's a sort of minor detail in the grand scheme of things we are discussing today. Um, it helps to cure this, if you look at quark fraction, maybe a little bit earlier appearance of quarks that you want. Even though it's a small fraction, maybe at two times normal nuclear density, you don't quite expect. Um, well, in quark ionic matter, as we discussed, this regulator, there is also this issues, this early appearance of quarks. But the regulator, at least in this form, doesn't change the qualitative picture as where, as far as where uh, which configuration prefers lower end. Okay, uh, speed of sound, as we already discussed, the qualitative features we expect from um, Newton star observations in two cases. So this is quarkionic. This is what I was talking about without regulator, how it looks like. Um, so it, it shoots up, and then there is actually there is a first order phase transition. So there is a discontinuity in speed of sound 
without regulator. And then it reappears. Uh, with regulator, you can make it behave smoothly, reasonably, but there is uh, like the value of regulator, like right? you have to get it from somewhere. Barrick work, yeah, smooth behavior without attraction, exceeds the conformal limit, although no pronounced peak. And if we add attraction, something we are still playing with a little bit, you can get a more pronounced peak and even some jumps in the speed of sound. Still, everything is causal, but some possible additional structures emerge. Okay, here, maybe for the lack of time, I don't discuss it too much, but it's a related quantity uh, trace anomaly. And it can tell you whether you're reaching this conformal limit of the, of the theory. That would be indicated by crossing uh, zero, because of delta becoming negative. But it's, it's, what we can say so far is that it might become negative, but it sensitively depends on the parameters of the model. Okay, so this is Outlook. Uh, I won't spend too much time here, but we did excluded volume model. Uh, we didn't try to do realistic low density equation of state, but well, you could do that if you add attraction. So this energy per baryon will have binding energy of 16 MeV and other properties that we know here. And this would be a different low density. If low density is large difference, then eventually the difference becomes uh, distinct. But this will also influence the onset of quarks and the transition. So if we had this uh, behavior with very smooth behavior the speed of sound, it can become considerably more peaked. And baric work doesn't guarantee that you don't exceed uh, a causal limit. It could happen that you exceed it. But it does depend sensitively on some variations of how we do repulsion, uh, exuded volume repulsion. So the one example we discussed is a linear exuded volume, the simplest one. But there are other models one can consider which has certain justification in their application to real gas equation of states, which will give a different answer. So this sensitivity is something we are exploring. And another uh, outlook for which there is no results yet, so this is just generic mass radius relation, is of course neutron star matter in very quark, quarkionic picture, of course was done, but can be compared. So we consider it as a spin symmetric matter so far. In a sense, it's a degenerate case because you have the same amount of, uh, on average, protons and neutrons, same amount of U and D quarks. So you have only Fermi surfaces of nucleons and of quarks. But if you go into isospin projections, then U and D surfaces coincide, proton neutron surfaces coincide. But when you go to neutron matter, then you will probably expect something like this for very quarks, right? You have neutron, for example, pure neutron matter. So you have neutrons up and down quarks. Neutrons occupy the C, but neutrons have U, D, D content. So you can actually put some U quarks at low momenta because you, you didn't saturate all possible states for quarks if you only put neutrons, right? So you have here neutrons, you have D quarks starting from zero, and then which occupy uh, some fraction of available states, and then they occupy all states above the Fermi surface of nucleons. And then there is for U quark, same thing, but also because of sharp neutrality, there are more U quarks than D quarks. There is also different value of the Fermi surface. So there is multiple Fermi surfaces, and this is something which should be done carefully. But hopefully we will also get here. But with this, I can summarize the talk. So we discussed quark hadron continuity and coexistence at zero temperatures, which, at least in simplistic picture, imply a mixed phase in the momentum space. You have Pauli principle for quarks, and both quarks confined into baryons and those not. And we consider two opposite scenario for this mixture with Pauli principle. We find this, uh, so one is quarkionic scenario, the baryonic Fermi surface, another one very quark, quark Fermi surface. So two opposite scenarios. 
so energetically, this picture disfavors quark-ionic matter, as we have seen. But the resulting equations of state actually they don't look dramatically different. You have this transition from hadrons to quarks. Although one nice thing for Berry quarks was that um, it did not require infrared relays. So what this says that existing descriptions or realizations of quark ionic motor can concept, which mainly based on this quasi-particle picture, may require modification, right? Because we see that the energy minimization indicate this to be unstable in this quasi-particle picture. So what could be such modifications? Maybe there is momentum dependent nuclear interactions, right? So if you interactions may change whether nucleons are in the Fermi C at low momenta or they are at high momenta in Fermi surface. So this would be a refinement of excluded volume. Maybe we have to abandon the quasi-particle picture as we discussed, we don't solve QCD with quasi-particle picture, but we would at least like to approximate QCD, right? Uh, so maybe we need a better solution. Or maybe a regulator um, needs to be, right, that we discussed needs to be something else, more judicious choice of a regulator, which will also would make it stable and preferred. Outlook, so we, well, both for Parkionic and Barry Quark scenarios, we would like to match it to a realistic low density equation of state and more realistic nuclear interactions and see what how this modifies things. Consider variations on Pauli exclusion principles. So not only consider these two extreme opposites, but also in between, right? You could have overlapping confined, the confined quarks. You could have some house of pancakes, right? Have like quarks, barons, quarks, barons, and so on. You can imagine many. And of course, isospin asymmetry and applications to neutron stars so far, it's isospin symmetric. It's not directly applicable that we've done it yet for a while. But uh, thank you. We will take, take questions. Is there any questions here in the audience? Yeah, sure. Can you go to the state of sound? Uh, the uh, which one of uh, them? This one or this one? Uh, or before yeah, this that? One. Uh -huh. So I was just wondering, uh, there's like, is there a phase transition in the, the, the weather yeah. there? Uh, yes. Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, yes. But it's, uh, it's, okay, I have to check, but it's a second order if I remember right. Okay. So there is a derivative. Actually, there is phase transition basically in all cases because you have onset of quarks. It's zero exactly, and then suddenly it's not zero. Sure. Right. So in all of these cases, you have a phase transition of some order. Um, for red curve, it's there is discontinuity and the speed of sound. It, well, speed of sound itself is a second derivative, so it's yeah, it's, it's a second just, order. That is. So you also have that for the uh, for the arbitrary one, I would assume. It's just that you can't see it. You can't see it, and it, it may also be of high. No, I was order. thinking for the quarkionic, because there is probably. Quarkionic. Okay. Uh, isn't there also a second order? Actually, I think that so this solid line without the regulator. Yeah, without the regulator. Yeah, yeah so. but without the regulator, I believe, I think. As also you have studied, you have these things, right? So you have smooth behavior of yeah, quark fraction. So there is no onset, right? It's already smooth. So it might be that. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Right. As you know, I made that graph. Without reg <laughs> with <laughs> well, that, so without regulator, it would be strictly zero. Yeah. And, uh, and then boom, as king. That's, that's, that's where you have first order phase transition. I believe with finite lambda, you don't have phase transition because it's already smooth. In the so quark yeah, fraction. Uh, I was wondering one more thing that mm -hmm. we this graph. So, so I assume you haven't tried uh, doing any mass radiance relations with this. Oh, yeah, right. Because we need to yeah, because do things differently right. with all of these multiple Fermi surfaces. But well, I think we can do this, right? Because, um, right, we just have more parameters. With respect to which we minimize things, but okay, we have also this condition. So, uh, so we just need to carefully include all these scenarios, right? That uh, you can have 
So you have D quarks with a factor of one third below Fermi surface. Mm -hmm. And maybe it stops there. But maybe you, then you increase density and you, you saturate this factor of one third and you have to go also up. And then for U quarks, you have separate fermions. So we need to carefully do this minimization. But I think if you do it, 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 I think there is no conceptual issue. So we should get the mass radius. Other than more than I have to point out. I thought it would be the same. It's like, no, this character of surface feels counterintuitive to me because you have forms of top. And this means that if I have very soft code, very soft code, I will be at the quarks instead. I would, it's very easy to excite quarks because they're mm -hmm. soft, right? But if I make my probe harder, mm -hmm. now you say that I would actually excite brains. Well, so it's, would you know, it's like inverse asymptotic freedom to me, it looks like. Yeah, but, in, but, but in which regime that? though? But in which regime? Because it's uh, at high densities, they are so deep in the sea that if you can you excite them? Okay. You still like you need very little energy to excite quarks, which you would expect actually you to know, you need probably need higher probe mm -hmm. or hard probe to actually excite. I mean, like mm -hmm. this is oh my point. Yeah, yeah, sure. Right? But uh, I think that uh, it's also a valid point that. I mean, we did, okay, I discussed momentum dependent nuclear interactions, but we could also do something else for quarks, not just free quarks, okay. something with corrections and see. But, you know, I mean, they, I mean, we don't necessarily promote this picture, but rather we point out the problem because, okay, we did the, we did the extreme opposite, right? Yeah. But just consider a small perturbation here and the energy will go down, right? So it's the issue of stability yeah. for quarking. Yeah. <laughs> so if you see this, bro, when you see QCD, I think that I'm bad about against QCD, but yeah. Uh, well, nevertheless, uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Let me ask if there's one question on mm -hmm. Zoom and then not. Is there any question from the Zoom? Oh, okay. I have like very simple questions. So, first of all, mm -hmm. in the excluded volume model or the Van der Waals model, we have a parameter, for example, the ideal volume. And yes. are those parameters uh, calculated from the first order, first principle calculations or are they? No, okay. Yes. So, so far, no, so far, the excluded volume was just taken some value used in the literature just to make the comparison. Uh, as far as uh, realistic values, if you like, you can fit A and B to nuclear ground state, binding energy and normal nuclear density. So there are two equations to solve. And yeah, that, that, so for example, this is done for these parameters reproducing nuclear ground state here, these curves. Mm -hmm. But the plots I showed for, uh, the plot I showed here was done just pure excluded volume with with a with a parameter for comparison. So you could, um so okay if you if you ask how it compares, so the one for nuclear matter is around two times normal nuclear density. But then there is also attraction and then there are other variations if you do nuclear matter because you cannot get nuclear matter. Ground state with, with exclude volume on the with repulsion on the right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we have one question from James. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, James. Yeah, could you go back to your figure um, slide oh, where you you're, you're showing oh, maybe oh no, maybe just me. Let's see. Can you go back to the slide where you're showing uh quarkionic versus uh berry quark uh in momentum space? Right. So yeah, so um the momentum in the diagrams is I assume a quark momentum in every case. Is that correct or is that a yeah. misimpression? Okay, no, it's correct, but there is a footnote missing. So uh, you have to basically scale by uh, NC factor. Yeah, the 
quark. So this should be scaled by mc, kf divided by mc, and you would have a smaller circle. Um, but so we express this uh, sort of, um, yeah, it, it's on the level of quarks, if you like. It's baryons, but it's actually quarks inside baryons, right? Okay, so good, good. I, that's what I was trying to make sure yeah. I understood. Oh, that, so, yeah, it's a little bit. And is the old computer. computer. Yeah. 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 Well, I have a, a couple of questions, but maybe I'll just take one at the moment. So at the surface between the quarks and the baryons, in either case, do you expect such a, a sharp transition as pictured here? Or would it be maybe natural to think about some sort of percolation going on where there's much more uh, fuzziness between oh. uh, quarks and baryons, for example? Yeah, I mean, realistically, I, I'm pretty sure there is fuzziness, right? But then you have to model it additionally in some way, right? So maybe some Gaussian uh, distribution instead of a sharp edge. Like we assumed there is exactly one third of baryon momentum carried by every quark, right? So it's a yeah. So, yeah. So, in other words, it's a quark that's sitting very close to, uh, say, KF in either case. Mm -hmm. um, it, would, it might be hard to distinguish whether the quark is a uh, quasi-free quark versus a quark that's, say, bound inside of a nucleon. Um, this this is really the, the physics picture yeah. I would like to have in my mind. Is is it so clean to say it's one or the other? Uh, OK. Here it's constructed to be clean, but um, I'm pretty sure that yeah. Uh, it's a simplification here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There will be positives for sure. Because I would imagine if you're holding the system in equilibrium mm -hmm. at, at or, you know, and examine that those components near the Fermi surface that, that the, um, something That's more close to a, a percolation situation is going on where, you know, you're, you're mixing the two phases in a way where, where confinement is not a, not a, a strict concept for a quark. Anyway, that's just a speculation on my part. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do you have another question here or in the Zoom audience? I'm sorry. No, no, no. On slide seven, you also mentioned that from the first, well, we are very much sure about the uh we we know the from the fluctuation result that the the there's a there's no evidence of critical point near the for mu b less than equal to yes mm -hmm. is that from first principle lattice principle calculations or no well, for heavy ions uh, it's uh so you, you can map heavy ion collisions of different energies on the phase diagram okay. through hadron hydrochemistry and at energies above 20 GV square root of S, which corresponds okay. roughly to maybe over three, right? and this three. Uh, you see, so the proton cumulants behavior, I mean, not, no enhancement you could attribute to fluctuation, but you can actually attribute it to mundane things like uh, baryon number conservation and the excluded volume. I just want to know whether. They're calculated from model or first principles. Oh, heavy ions is always from model. There is no first principles for heavy ions. Mm -hmm. Because those numbers are very high for lead species. Uh, okay. This? Um, no, no, this, okay. Uh, this, this is uh, heavy ion. Hmm. Well, they extrapolate roughly to this, right? Taylor expansion. So they don't simulate here directly. They simulate here, but they calculate the derivatives. Yeah. And you can see that there is apparent Convergence. Okay, it's not mathematically rigorous statement, right? You need to know all terms of Taylor expansion to to say this with confidence, but it's hundred percent confidence. But the the way it looks like from different latest collaboration is that up to roughly this. It's some error, and the error is higher in that area. Sometimes what they also do is that they take some negative kinetic potential in order to have more precision in the expansion. But still, the same expansion is higher in terms of the chemical potential, the error is bigger and bigger. 
But I mean, that's 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 we'll say that's uh with our level of confidence, that's what we can say. That's mm -hmm. what happened. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, at mu zero, it's it's more rigorous because they did finite size scaling, mm -hmm. right? And there you don't see anything. It's finite mu is extrapolation. Well, if there's some more questions, then I will take it in a for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.